connected to today's topic, we invite you to be part of the show by calling us during the live broadcast, which is Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And if you're in North America, you can call 1-800-221-9460. 1-800-221-9460. Outside North America, you call country code 1, area code 205-271-2980. 1-205-271-2980. Or you can, you can contact us by email by writing to Scripture and Tradition at EWTN.com. You can also follow us and participate with the show by seeing it on YouTube. Okay? Now we're continuing to go through my book, Wheat and Tares, Restoring the Moral Vision of a Scandalized Church. You can get that at EWTN's Religious Catalog. Just go to EWTNRC.com where it is item number 810. Nine, eight. We'll be starting at page 89, okay? Before we get into that, um, we're obviously in a truly horrible situation internationally with the attack on is Israel uh, on Saturday. It was a very important Jewish holy day. It was also the anniversary of the Yom Kippur War from back in the early 70s. And it, it, we have to be very clearly Christian here in our approach. Our Lord says, blessed are the peacemakers. And we are not here to encourage the killing of anybody. At the same time, we also see that this was a horrible attack and not something that came out of a declaration of war. It didn't happen uh, by Hamas uh, telling the Israelis, all right, we'll face you down. And frankly, I think they didn't do that because they know they can't take the Israeli army on as an army. They wouldn't even try it. So what they did was to do a terror attack against mostly sleeping civilians. Remember, Saturday, Shabbat, is the day of rest in Israel. And it being a major holy day and a very popular one, uh, ending the Feast of Tabernacles, celebrating Simchat Torah, all this, this was a day of real rest and and to be at peace. But the terror against unarmed people, people unprepared who didn't know they were about to be attacked, and killing uh, uh, children along with adults, uh, beheading soldiers when they caught them, but shooting uh, small children, burning some in front of their parents. I imagine the horror and the taking elderly people, the 85-year-old uh, survivor of the Holocaust is taken as a hostage. This is not the action of an army. This is the action of bandits who are cowards. There's no way around that. And the other tragic and horrible moral element is that there was no way that this could help bring about a greater sense of peace or justice. This is an expression of outrage perhaps, but if you simply express rage with no accomplishment to show for it, you are acting uh, not even like a small child. You're acting like someone who has lost their ability to think like a madman. 
This is the way I would look at this terrible, terrible crime. We also have to keep in mind that all of the money that was spent for the rockets and weapons, and by the way, the evidence points more and more that some of this material was bought from Afghanistan. It's the equipment that we had left there. And now it's being used in this terror attack. I remember that was seven, over $7 billion worth of equipment. That's showing up. And then the international manipulation of this with Iran training Hamas and helping them to prepare for a very carefully coordinated attack. I think I heard that there were 80 openings in the wall and fence from Gaza to Israel. And they all did it at the same time. It was well coordinated and meant to cause terror. This is not something that anybody can say, well, it was justified. There may be grievances and, there, and serious grievances, but this kind of attack does not resolve them. But instead, as we see taking place now these days and in for the near future, it leads to a greater destruction of the city of Gaza that people who did not fight, who are not necessarily part of Hamas, are also going to suffer on the Gaza side. You've accomplished self-destruction and at the same time, killing other people. Your enemies perhaps, but your own people suffer too. This is not a justifiable act on any grounds, not on any moral grounds. For Iran and Iran's leader to say this was a victory, then you have to ask, what was your goal? If you're the president of Iran and you think this is a victory, where now the Israelis will, are destroying and uh, many areas where Hamas is located, and of course there'll be terrible collateral damage. They can't, they can't stop that in order to get at Hamas. And you think that this is a victory where these all kinds of people, including more women and children and elderly people, non-combatants, are inevitably going to suffer. What kind of victory do you have in mind? This would be the victory only for the evil one, for Satan. He's the one who is a murderer and a liar at his very core of his personality. And this, he would be the only one pleased by this or those who follow him. Let's pray that there would be a resolution. I don't, I don't know that that's a peaceful resolution doesn't look feasible. That's not going to happen. Both sides are fighting too hard. And I don't see where that will come about um, for even longer. But let's pray that those in the Middle East who would accept the call of God to be peacemakers would find a way to serve God by bringing peace. And that's not saying in any way that Israel is unjustified in seeking out the leaders of Hamas. No, they have to be stopped. But again, we can only lament greater loss of life and loss of more innocence on both sides. So let's keep our own clear sense. In the Old Testament and in the Quran, 
it says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. That's not our values. So we look at these conflicts differently. Our Lord told us to reject that principle and to absorb the suffering and pain. That's not going to be the case with the combatants that we're dealing with here. So that's not their approach. We can't appeal to that. But we can do what we can to be sources of peace and encourage our government to be wise and careful in how it approaches this very volatile situation and hopefully to bring, find some way to not use the sword. In some ways, this fits the topic we are dealing with in my book um, and in our Lord's response in, to what's happening in Gethsemane. We talked last time about Judas betraying Jesus with a kiss. Now we see that the apostles respond differently, especially Peter. And let's begin with Luke 22, verses 49 to 50. When those who were about him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. So this is something that uh, we see. Now, we don't get the name of the slave at the, the, in the first three Gospels, only in John. In John 18, verse 10, it mentions that his name was Malchus. It says, Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. And I think this is correct. Um, at the time when the other Gospels were written, some of the people involved were still alive. And when John wrote, everybody had, you know, this was, he wrote in the 90s, well after the Jewish revolt against the Romans. And you, there wouldn't be any worry about keeping names secret and such. So that's why St. John could talk about it more. And this is something that we see our Lord, you know, responds to. And he responds to the use of this in three different ways. Remember, and they're against this use of the sword. First, he put an end to the attempt to use armed resistance. And he laid down a principle consistent with what he said. No more of this. Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. This is uh, Matthew 26, verse 52. And uh, also in Luke 22, verse 51, John 18, 11, all of these verses make it very clear that if you take the sword, you'll die by the sword. And he says that to his disciples because he doesn't want them to die that way. This is a very important point. Secondly, his next response was uh, to go, and as we see in Luke 22, verse 51, he touched the servant's ear and healed him. He didn't say, well, you were with these people, I guess you deserved it. No, no, he healed the man. Which, uh, one of the odd things about that is you would think that perhaps the other folks around him would say, well, wait a minute, why are we arresting this man? He's, he's not doing any violence and he's trying to bring healing. But they, they don't think that. And this is something, again, we want in, in this conflict that we see in 
Israel and Palestine and in other conflicts that are usually closer to home. We uh, very much want to be folks who can, you know, bring a form of healing to people. It's a very, very important. The third reaction is that he puts the whole situation into the context of God's plan. That's why in John 18, verse 11, Jesus said to Peter, Shall I not drink the cup which the Father has given me? We see parallels to that in Matthew 26, 39, Mark 14, 36, Luke 22, 42. This is repeated. In the Gospels, our Lord sees all of this in the context of the salvation of the human race. This is his purpose. It's not just get, escape from this one situation, but rather the, uh, you know, the plan of salvation is to, to do this. Now, first of all, notice again the phrase, shall I not drink the cup the Father's given me? Remember, this goes back to what had been said earlier about the cup of suffering that he had mentioned in his prayer, that this was something that, um, you know, he, when he was praying in Gethsemane, he said, take this cup away from me, but not my will, but thy will be done. He knew by that point after that prayer, it was the Father's will to take the cup. But it also deals with the question that our Lord had posed to the two brothers, James and John. Remember, they had asked him, we talked about this some time ago, how in Mark chapter 10, they had asked, let us sit one at your right and one at your left. And Jesus' question to them was, in Mark 10, 38, are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism with which I'm baptized. That makes clear what he's talking about here, that this cup that he's had drinking is one that he will offer to the apostles, but there's no way that they are ready for that. And it was something that they say, oh yeah, we can do that. And that was an easy answer when the possibility of suffering was theoretical. When it was something that they thought could come. And especially when they were th focusing on their request. Oh yeah, that, then we'll get to sit on the right and the left. We'll be Mr. Big. That, that was their idea. So yeah, anything you say. But when it comes down to this moment in Gethsemane, when the cup of suffering is offered to them, uh, they are not so eager for it. Okay? And then remember also how the, uh, at another time in the gospel, or even earlier in Mark 9 verse 5, when they see Jesus transfigured, something that was preparing for the resurrection, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is well that we are here. Let us make three booths, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Again, all that sounds like a good idea. But when it comes to following the Father's actual plan to do what Jesus said, then they're not so interested then they say, well, let, well, how about the sword? Let's try that. They're not willing to d listen to Jesus and do what the Father said. And so this is something that is a very important way to look and a very important aspect of Peter's attempt to fight for Jesus and see this through. It's not what our Lord asked for. It's not what he's seeking. We're going to take a break and continue on with this passage. So please stay with us.
Washington, D.C. I'm Tracy Sable with an EWTN Newslink. President Joe Biden is set to deliver remarks on the conflict in Israel today. In a White House statement, he said the connection. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy says that he is open to returning to the role for a brief period of time. Majority Leader Steve Scalise adds that Republican House members want to reach a decision quickly. With no speaker in place, the U.S. is limited in the aid that they can provide Israel. Delegates at the Synod on Synodality participated in a Greek Byzantine divine liturgy at St. Peter's Basilica yesterday. The service kicked off the second week of the assembly. There will be four other masses celebrated during the Synod. I'm Tracy Sable with EWTN News Nightly. Follow us on Facebook and X and be sure to join us this evening. If you really love Lourdes, then knowing Bernadette is the key to knowing Lourdes. Lourdes is powerful. We see this when we serve there, the difference that a person, when they first arrive and how they leave. I was convinced I was coming to Lourdes to help sick people and realized that in fact, they helped me. Bienvenue, welcome to my Lord's faith journey. Here on the Global Catholic Network, EWTN. All right, welcome back. We're continuing with uh, this scene where Peter drew his sword in Gethsemane. And uh, we, we see that our Lord gave a critique both of the apostles and of the crowd that came to arrest him. He's not saying one is at fault, but both of them are at fault. And we see, for instance, when he says in Matthew 26, verse 52, that Jesus told Peter, put your sword back into its place. Okay, so this, this is the thing. And his uh, critique that when he, when he spoke to the apostles is that, again, all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Now that fits most of human history, that people who uh, have made a career of being soldiers and of conquest very frequently died in battle. That's, that's one of the things, and that's just an observation of human history. So, you know, that's kind of typical. And Another thing that he gives as his critique to the apostles is in Matthew 26, verse 23, uh, 53, sorry. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? So our Lord is well aware that as the son of the father, he could call on, you know, 12 legions of angels. A legion was usually about 5,500 to 6,000. And scripture frequently speaks of myriads of angels, tens of thousands of angels. And you could have gotten, uh, you know, as many angels as you wanted, 12 
legions. And notice, why did he pick 12 legions? Well, he has 12 apostles present because Judas is still there. He hadn't gone away yet. And instead of you 12 apostles who are really making a mess of things, I could have 12 legions of angels. But that's not the way that it's going to happen, that he could have anything he wants from the Father, but that's not going to be the way. And then we also see that he who uh, has these angels at his, at his disposal when he comes to judge the living and the dead, he'll have the power of the angels with him. Remember Matthew 25, verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he'll sit on his glorious throne. He'll have the angels with him to judge all the earth. And that shows up in many of the parables, that the angels will be the ones separating the wicked from the righteous. So uh, you have that. And also you see in uh, Ma Matthew 4, 11 and Mark 1, 13, that when the devil had finished tempting him, and the devil left him, behold, angels came and ministered to him. So he's aware that the angels are there to serve him. And he also knew that he had the power over death and life. He could have called on the Father's power. Remember John chapter 10, verses 17 to 18. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it Again, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. And I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. This charge I received from my Father. So he knows that the power of life and death and his own uh, suffering and death is something that is not in the hands of the apostles. He has that power. That's why he was able to walk right through the crowd in Nazareth. Remember Luke chapter 4, verse 29, when the, the people of Nazareth rose up and put him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill in which their city was built, that they might throw him down headlong. But passing through the midst of them, he went away. He walked right through them. He didn't start picking up stones and fighting and all that. He just walked right through them. And he, again, in John chapter 8, after he had made it very clear, he had said that he is the Lord God in John chapter 8, twice, he said in that passage. And in response in John 8 verse 59, they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. It was not the time for him to die. This was, that was at the Feast of Tabernacles in John 8. That wasn't the time for him to die. It would be at Passover. That was the time that would show he's the Lamb of God. And so this is something that is, is very important uh, about him. And at this point in Gethsemane, it is time for him to lay down his life. He struggled with it, doesn't like the idea, but he does the will of his Father, and this is the time for that. And the apostles' feeble attempts to stop and prevent this, his death by drawing a sword, it's not going to work. It's not going to work at all. And so the um, uh, sleepiness that they had, remember, they just woke up. When he was praying, they were asleep, out of grief, but they were asleep. And their sleepiness had prevented them from being able to comprehend what Jesus was up to and what it meant to drink the cup the Father was giving him. We also see that our Lord makes it very clear that his arrest fulfills scripture. And he says in Matthew 26, verse 54, 
But then how should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? He recognizes that this is going to fulfill the Father's plan, predicted long ago that he would be a suffering servant who lays down his life and is buried among the wicked and dies among them. So each step of the way from the Last Supper, this suffering and trials, his crucifixion, and death, and burial, and eventually his resurrection. All of that was predicted in Scripture. And they are not going to be prevented by Peter bringing out a sword and cutting off an ear. This is something. Rather, our Lord understands that each one of these elements, that of the cup of suffering that he must undergo from this time forward, each element of that will be for the salvation of the whole human race. And that's why throughout he will even say very little. He won't even argue with people. He is going to be that suffering servant who is silent like a lamb led to slaughter. That's what we see here in Gethsemane. We'll stop at this point. Um, and, and next time we'll take a look at why, uh, you know, how he addressed the crowd. So we'll get to that next time. But I'd like to go to some of your questions and comments. Let me start off with this one from Priscilla. Father Mitch, why do non-Catholic Christians not honor the crucifix or stations of the cross? Overall, you know, when Protestants have a cross, it's usually without the corpus on it. And the reason that they uh, have that a cross without the corpus, without the body, is that they say they see the empty cross as a sign of Christ's resurrection. They say he's raised from the dead and he's not still hanging on the cross. Now, and the same thing would apply to the stations of the cross. Now, I would say this to them. On one hand, I understand what they're saying and they want to honor the resurrected Christ. And, and that's a, a, a very good thing. But we also hear, whether they're evangelical or oftentimes mainline Protestants, they will say, I was saved because I had faith and Jesus washed me in his blood. I was washed in the blood of the Lamb. Now, how is it possible to say that at this time in history, as I repent of my sins and make an act of faith, that I am washed in the blood of the Lamb unless, unless the blood of the Lamb is still available, that Christ crucified is eternally giving himself to us. So in that sense, the crucifixion is perpetually available. They, they have an understanding of that. And it is part of the spiritual conversion of so many evangelical Protestants. And it's a deep, that, that's really deeply experienced. But it means that Christ's crucifixion is still available and that it's not only the resurrection. Because he's God, his crucifixion and resurrection are eternally available to us. And I think that's a very important thing. We represent that with the crucifix and we remind ourselves that we're called to pick up our cross and follow Jesus daily. That's why we also make the stations of the cross because much of life is like picking up the cross. And so we want to remind ourselves of the spiritual meaning of our suffering. That meaning comes from being 
united with Jesus Christ and his suffering. So that's why we do that. But they somehow that doesn't quite fit in their spirituality. All right, let's take a question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Detroit, Michigan. Good to have you. Welcome. Thank you, Father Mitch. Uh, so I have a two-part question. Um, what's going on currently is, and I understand Hamas is a uh, extreme Muslim group, mm -hmm. and uh, but do do Muslims as a whole, would, do you think they would condemn this? And does the Quran um, like teach peace? And then with the Israelis having the Torah, is, is there is ultimately peace as well? Not the same peace through Jesus Christ, yeah. but. Yeah, yeah, you know, here's, you know, the Quran has a, two stages. One stage is what was written and, and revealed at Mecca. And then in 622 AD, Muhammad, who was persecuted by the pagans of Mecca, had to flee to the city called Yathrib. Uh, today it's called Medina. Medina, though, is just the Arab word for city. So um, uh, the, the name of the place was Yathrib. And he fled there. And the verses that were revealed at Mecca are the verses of peace. They talk especially about God judging the souls on the basis of their behavior, that you will either be judged and sent to hell if you are wicked, or God will judge you and bring you to paradise, uh, heaven. And these verses even say there is no argument about religion, but we can discuss it, but not you know, argue and fight over it. Those verses about peace belong to the Meccan period. But when he had moved to Medina or Yathrib, then you see a change. He engaged in a number of wars. Some of his followers had raided a, a caravan from Mecca, and that started a series of wars. The Muslims uh, you know, defended themselves, and then uh, by 630 or so, uh, I forget the exact year, they were able to conquer Mecca. They had gained the, the support of many others, but there was a, lot, a number of fights, serious fights. And that's when you see the verses that, that he doesn't use the word jihad for them, you know, but he does say, Katalul uh, Kufar. Try to kill the infidel. Kataluhum, kill them. In Surah 8, verse 12, cut off their head at the neck. And, you know, there's a verse 61 for, God loves those who try to kill in his path. That these verses, you know, are verses that you know, in the response to the war, call for, um, you know, trying to kill the infidels. Okay. And if Christians and Jews don't submit to the Muslims, Christians and Jews could keep their own religion because they're people of the book, but they had to submit to Muslims by paying a tax by which Muslims would then use that to protect Christians from attack. That was, but you had to pay that tax called the jizya. And that, that's been abolished in Muslim countries, uh, but it was part, part of the way things were. And when it was raised, sometimes Christians were forced to convert or leave the, the, their era, and same with Jews. Um, that, uh, and if they don't pay jizya, then you can kill them. You have in Surah 9, uh, the verse of the sword, 927. Um, so, you know, there, there's a big change in the Quran. And here's the, something that's key. There's a principle within Islam um, called abrogation, uh, where 
the earlier verses are abrogated by the last thing Muhammad wrote or was written in the Quran on a topic. So the verses of peace can be followed, but they are in fact abrogated by the later verses. Whereas in the Old Testament, you see also there were a lot of fights. But as the Old Testament developed, you see uh, increasingly an openness to welcoming non-Jewish people. So, for instance, in Isaiah 56, a fairly late passage, my house is to be a house of prayer for all nations. That's, you know, earlier on, they, they fought the nations and, and, you know, tried to wipe them out. But as time went on, they came to understand that, no, that's not what the Lord wants. Uh, and so he wants the nations to come and worship. We Christians see that Christ took it even further by, you know, having us uh, called to love our enemies. Um, very difficult, you know, it's a very difficult thing to do um, for, for us Christians. Uh, but that's, the, that would be a ch the change that, that takes place. And hopefully that helps. We'll take a little break. We'll come back with more of your questions from the studio and your calls and emails. So please stay with us. Completely on demand. Huh? For me, you get two for one. Scripture and tradition, and EWTN Live. Hey, remember, you're always at home with us. Hey, you want to live right? The doctor is in. Anytime, anywhere. Hmm? Wait, Life on the Rock is on demand too. You can take your journey anytime. And don't forget about all of those grace-filled women. Right! <laughs> Hey, no one has more hours of Catholic programming on demand than EWTN. Just go to EWTN.com forward slash on demand. There's nothing to fill out, no membership required. All you need is an internet connection and you're good to go. Come on over and bring a friend. We've got Bye. hundreds of shows. EWTN on demand. Not only are these programs in demand, the hosts can be pretty demanding too. Please, watch. Go to EWTN.com forward slash on demand or download the free EWTN app and watch on Roku, Apple TV, Google TV, and Amazon Fire TV. Next time on EWTN Live, Peggy Stanton looks back on her journey from cultural to committed Catholic and her career as one of Washington, D.C.'s first female news correspondents on the next EWTN Live. Blood of Christ, price of our salvation. Pray for us. The litany of the most precious blood of Jesus on EWTN. Thank you, thank you. Now, first of all, before we get back to your questions, I want to invite you to join me tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for EWTN Live. We'll be speaking with some old friends. Uh, one will be the journalist Grzegorz Gorne and his friend and photographer Janusz Roszikoin. 
about the Blessed Virgin Mary and her earthly life and their new book, which illustrates the truth and goodness and beauty of Mary, the mother of God. They've done a number of these wonderful books, and this is one more of them. So this is a great thing. Look forward to having them back. Uh, now let's take a look at another email, this time from Janet in El Paso. It says, Father Mitch, please explain what happened to the communion rail and kneeling during the reception of the Eucharist. I would also like to know why the bells have been taken away. We need to be reminded of the importance of the body in Christ and who the priest is elevating during the uh, consecration. Sometimes I feel that Vatican II was a curse upon the Catholic Church. All I see is liberalism and parishes doing whatever they please. In the old church, Mass was exactly the same wherever you went to church. I find this very disheartening. Janet in El Paso, Texas. Well, Janet, a couple things I'd like to urge you to do. Um, first of all, I would suggest that you read the Constitution on the liturgy from Vatican II, okay? It's the first document that was uh, written at the Council, and you will see very clearly that nothing in that document said to stop kneeling. Nothing said anything about stopping the bells. Didn't say that. And in fact, in that same document, it mentions that in the what Roman rite of the Catholic Church, which I assume you belong to, uh, Latin is to have pride of place. I believe tomorrow we're celebrating the feast of Pope St. John the 23rd. When uh, just before I started uh, high school seminary, he had written an encyclical making sure that seminarians were still learning Latin. He insisted on it. And so we had a brand new Latin textbook written for us to, so that we, he wanted seminarians to learn how to speak Latin, as well as, of course, read it. So uh, that was the uh, kind of thing that was going on at, during the council, because I started high school during the council. The changes about removing bells and uh, kneeling and kneelers, that happened after the council without anything being said about that in the council. And mostly those were decisions made uh, by local churches. So it was, uh, by that I mean not just the local parishes, but also from the dioceses. So, you know, check into that. And again, I would urge you to prayerfully read what the Vatican Council actually said, because I happen to know that there were a lot of people who had uh, been saying that, well, Vatican II said we're supposed to get rid of the statues in church, for instance. That's not true. That's just not true. It never said that. Uh, you know, the <laughs> some of God's children make things up. Um, draw your own conclusions about the moral quality of that. And so read it. And I urge all of you to read what it actually says. You know, is it the most exciting literature? No, no. This is not a good cowboy novel. Uh, there, there, there's no rootin' tootin', shooting cowboys riding through uh, the range. But you find out what, we're, what the dignity of the mass that we're called to, to live out. So this would be something that you know, should find out and maybe get other people in your parish to discuss to make sure that at your parish, mass is celebrated all the more. 
and more, uh, it should be celebrated with solemnity and holiness and lift us up. And I'll just mention one other thing too, as a little side point. I grew up in the 50s and I also can recall that there were some priests saying mass in Latin. Uh, we would time them. Well, he was done in 17 minutes. Today, he broke an all-time record, 16 minutes. <laughs> Some of them were just rushing through it. And it wasn't all that more dignified for being rushed through. So there were problems back then, too. And that happened in the past. Uh, so that, what we want is our offering of Mass to be a prayer and adoration to Jesus and a lifting up of our hearts and minds to Him and a focus on Him. Of course, Latin language is not going to save us. The Latin language didn't die for us, didn't rise again from the dead. Jesus Christ did. And we have to focus on Jesus our Lord. But we also can look at the various things that help us to make sure that we worship Him uh, with our whole hearts, minds, and souls. I have another email from Roger, who is in Mora, Minnesota. Uh, Dear Father Pacwa, Scripture says that God created man in His own image and likeness. We see the Son, Jesus, as a man, though although divine. In what way is man in the image of God the Father and in the image of the Holy Spirit? Or is the likeness and image of God sh only shown through the Son, Jesus? Roger in Mora, Minnesota. Roger, it's a very important question that remember something very important. It says that we were created in the image and likeness of God at the beginning of the human race. Not only after God became flesh in Jesus Christ. That's not when it, we began to be in the image and likeness of God. We're in the image and likeness of God from the beginning when God was all three persons were pure spirit. We were already in the image and likeness of God. So then we have to ask, what does that mean? Well, one of the clues is in the scripture where it says in that same passage in uh, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and following, that he gave the man and the woman the uh, rule over all the other creatures. Now, how is it that we are able to have sway and rule over other animals? For instance, why is it that we catch more sharks than they catch of us? And the answer is we have intellect. We know how to reason and think, and we can know things. Secondly, we also have free will, and we can, choose, we can know all sorts of options, and we can make a morally based choice, a choice based in knowing the virtues and values that best represent the holy God. And by having intellect, the ability to think, and even, con I mean, human beings know how to ride and control elephants. They, it doesn't take much for an elephant to roll over and kill anybody, any human on his back. But we use our reason in order to direct the elephants. It's remarkable, and many other things. And we can use the elephants to help build houses, or we can, as in ancient times, you could use them in battle. 
We have a choice about how we are going to do it. That's our free will. And in having free will and intellect, we are in the image and likeness of God. That's one aspect. Another one, and this is part of the genius of Pope St. John Paul II. He also talks about how the three persons of the Trinity are in an eternal relationship of love. They give of themselves to each other and they fully accept the other's gifts, that they are truly in love. And by being made man and woman, two individuals who complement each other and can give themselves to each other and can accept the other, we see at the very beginning that complementariness also is in the image and likeness of God's eternal love. Especially seeing as how it produces children who also can receive love and eventually give it back. So this is how we are in the image and likeness of God, whether it's in the incarnation or before the incarnation of God the Son. That is a very important component. Okay? So, yeah, we, we're in the image and likeness of all three persons in those ways. And that's something important to contemplate as we look at human dignity, and especially with this war, any other war, or crime. That's why all of that is, is evil and wrong. All right, well, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord bring peace to the Middle East and throughout the whole world to our cities. May Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And again, we can bring you this program and all the other programs we have only because of you. It's brought to you by you. So please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill and we'll be able to pay all of our bills too. God bless you all, and thank you. Are saints. With each of them, a charism of wisdom bestowed by the Holy Spirit for the good of the church. They are revered by the church for the value of their writing and teaching, and for the sanctity of their lives. They are the Doctors of the Church, an EWTN exclusive series, Friday at 5 p.m. Eastern on EWTN. EWTN TV and radio host John Martinoni has been using his own unique style of blue-collar apologetics to defend and explain Catholic teaching for years. His latest book, A Blue-Collar Answer to Protestantism, Catholic Questions Protestants Can't Answer, will be another addition to your evangelization toolbox. His simple, clear-cut explanations demonstrate the reasons why Protestantism, as a whole and in its parts, is flawed in its understanding of Christ's church, and ultimately the Bible itself. In these pages, you'll also find 30 pointed questions designed to make Protestants reevaluate what they believe and why. A blue collar answer to Protestantism, Catholic questions Protestants can't answer by John Martinoni, the latest release from EWTN Publishing. Now available at EWTNRC.com or call 1-800-854-6316.